Hey guys, it's your girl Shamar. Welcome back. We in the building. I hope y'all had a good time viewing all of the madness going around with this uh, eclipse. You know, um, <laughs> the energy was crazy, wasn't it guys? Um, so like I said, we're back this week and I got a good one for y'all this week. Um, I got some things I got to do. I have a kid visiting and so... Oh, Prince, Prince is gone now, guys, but Prince was here all week. So as a result, I got to do a little bit of a, a little bit of a shorter episode because I haven't had time, guys, to dig into Asher just yet. I got a little foul over here, you know what I mean? But there's so much more to get into, all right, as far as it concerns this family. And I'm going to be honest with y'all, I haven't quite figured out how exactly did they get into cahoots with Judah? So I have to make that connection, guys. While I got all of the info, and I can go into the, the oil database and clearly see all these Ashers, do yourself a favor. Do a Google search. Do Asher energy. And tons of stuff is going to come up, guys. So, you know, we can prove they're getting money. We can prove that they dipped their foot in oil. I just can't prove yet how they went about it. So I feel like I'd be bringing you guys a half of an episode. You understand what I'm saying? I got to dig a little deeper. I really want to make this connection, guys. And I know if I put my time and energy into it, I'll be able to do it. But with the, the I don't want to say a distraction. That's my kid, you know, but with the visit from my kid, um, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I hadn't had a lot of time to dig into it. So I'm sorry. I hope I ain't let y'all down. Um, but I got to have a little bit of a life too. And I hope I didn't let mother down actually. But I know mother wants me to make sure I, I'm connecting all of the dots. So to do that, guys, give me about another week. I'm going to find out. Believe me, I'm going to find out how they connect. Okay. Um, wasn't it the 13 bloodlines of certain families? Was it Aster? Right, guys? I wonder if Aster is Asher. Just a, just a quick thought I just had, guys. Might be something. I don't know. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to close this folder out, right? Oh, no. I'm hitting on Deuteronomy 33. Because look in the background, guys. What is this creature in the background? Anybody know? Oh, you know. You probably swatted at one yesterday. One probably landed in your drink yesterday and you threw it away. Or did it land in your food? Hmm? Do y'all know where these creatures come from? Did you know that there is a connection to Judah and the fly? <laughs> it's a royal connection, guys. Yeah. Check this out. This is interesting. I'm going to start in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, right? Because KG said to me <coughs> when we discovered who this, what the serpent is, all right? Or at least the serpent's seed, right? We discovered that the serpent seeds had to be the obligate parasite, right? Which leads to disease, right? Which basically is... Uh, what has shortened our lifespan? Remember the patriarchs back in the day were living to hundreds of years, right? So something had to come along to uh, break that up. And it was disease, guys. Of course, I've told y'all it ain't natural. It's not what's supposed to be happening to us. But when Adam left the garden alone, what did he do, guys? He had to defecate. He ate the fruit. He had to defecate somewhere. When he came out that garden, he defecated out here. Every bacteria since. <laughs> we know bacteria ex just grows exponentially, right? You ever look at bacteria? Do yourself a favor. Look at bacteria. Go look at a video of the bacteria multiplying. Okay, guys? So after he took that dump, it multiplied, guys. The bacteria from it, okay? You can't just come out here and poop and it's gone. So we're living in a cesspool of bacteria, guys, that has multiplied and grown. Okay, so all of our diseases are a result 
of our first father. Check this out, guys. KG asked me, well, what was the beast, Shamar? Because you, you did show us who the serpent's seed was, but I don't think that you quite showed us who the serpent was, right? Or the, the cattle, right? Because the uh, creator describes... Um, the creator describes the serpent as the smartest cattle in the field, right? In the bunch. All right, so let's check this out. Let's get into it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Her offspring will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, guys. So that's what the creator said to the serpent. Now, how is this connected to David, right? You ask. We're getting there. We are getting there. Check this out, guys. When we were researching the Assyrian army invasion, I saw something in the article that brought me back to my, my Judah research with this fly stuff. Watch this. Uh, Ten horrors of being invaded by the Assyrian army. Nearly 3,000 years ago, a nation few remember today swept through the Middle East. They laid cities to waste, tortured the survivors, and spread terror. Everywhere they went, this was Assyria, the first nation to make its military might its central policy and the first nation to torment its enemy with psychological warfare. Now, didn't I tell y'all that this was Ju didn't I tell y'all that this was Judah's best friend, Assyria? That they sent the biggest, baddest bully they could find into Israel to annihilate Israel. This wasn't no... I'm annoyed at you, little bro. I'm going to get somebody to come steal your lunch money. No. This was, I hate you, little bro. And I want you wiped out. So I'm going to send these maniacs on you and all your children. That's what Judah did. Watch this. But they learned some tactics from their best friend. I'm going to show you why I say that. Life behind a city's walls when the Assyrian army drew close was terrifying. Assyria made sure of it. They pioneered the use of terror as a weapon, and they made the lives of their enemies a living horror. Why is this important, right? An enemy that lived at war. Remember, y'all, I told y'all, we practice some of their tactics to this day. The men in our country have to register when they turn 18, don't they? They get ready to make the ladies have to register, too, because the men cried out, Oh, that's discrimination. You're only sending us. They would be right, according to our very own documents. But this is a tactic learned from Assyria. What else did David learn from Assyria? I'm going to show you. Keep up. The men worked. Uh, oh, wait, let me get to the top sentence right here. Every Assyrian man from the poorest to the richest was required to serve in the army. This was the first country. All right. The first country, guys. Why is that important? Let's keep going. This was the first country to make military service mandatory for every male citizen, no matter who he was. Do we not do this till this day here in this country? We got it from them. I'm going to show you who else got something from them. Watch this. Uh, the men work in a three year cycle in the first year. They would build roads, bridges. Oh! And great projects to build up their strength was they building this pipeline. Huh? Roads and projects. What? And bridges. Is this the bridges falling apart right now that they didn't build here? And they don't even know how to support? Quite possibly. I'm going to show y'all how we was actually involved in this slavery with building the pipeline. It wasn't no corn, y'all. It wasn't no cotton. We're right here to build up their strength and the strength of the empire. In the second year, they would go out to war. Then in the third year, they would be allowed to live with their families before starting the cycle again. The result was one of the strongest armies in the world. When they came to your town, the men at the gates were vicious 
and battle hardened. There were a lot of them. Okay, so they had uh, strength and might because of their numbers. Right. I want to I saw a paragraph that specifically talked about them numbering. Where did it go? Let's see. I don't want to get into the psychological terror. Well, maybe the fact right here is that, okay, they wanted a large army, guys, to demonstrate what's called military might. Okay, guys, it's right next to it. For some odd reason, this thing is freezing up on me, guys. What is going on? All right, check this out. This right here is called military might, right? When you start numbering your army, right? They started, the Assyrians were like the first people to start uh, building their might through a large army, okay? Yeah, my phone's dumbing out, guys. And who learned this tactic, right? Is this is the first nation to do this, to build up its military army um, with the registering of every citizen, guys? That's... That's what they did. They were registering every citizen, right? Now, watch this. I want to go to 2 Samuel 24. Stay with me, guys. This is important because I got to bring this home for y'all. Now, this one is a bit of a little bit of a long. Um, it's a bit of a long one. If you want to uh, open up your Torah and read it and then fast forward, you know, I don't know. But it's worth it to stick through it. Why? Because check this out. This is right here is going to open with David counts his army. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this story. I did before and it never really made sense to me before. Like, wow, well, what was so wrong about him counting his army, right? Like, because the Torah doesn't necessarily tell you what was wrong with it, but we see David punished for it. Right, guys? Yeah, if you've never read this, watch this. David counts his army. The Lord was very angry with Israel again, and he caused David to turn against the Israelites. Now remember, Judah is writing this. Is Judah an Israelite? Ask yourself that question. Now, don't forget, Judah got the pen, right? No, it's, it's Samuel, but... We don't know because this book came back out of what you call it, out of uh, out of captivity. So this could be a truthful document that they've altered. You know, we agree that some of this has happened in this book and they were the ones that came back with it, guys. So we got to kind of pick nonsense, pick truth out of nonsense, guys, that our book has been tampered with. Definitely. Like we already knew that. We just didn't know who was responsible. Right, guys? But now that we know that Levi is the Holy Roman Emperor and Levi was hanging out with Judah, are we surprised that our book was tampered with? No, we're not. I believe the Vatican has our books featuring some of our lady prophets, guys. You know, Deborah. OK, she was doing whole cases under a tree. And you trying to tell me we don't have a book about that somewhere? Man, listen, let's just keep going because I want to stay focused. The Lord was angry with Israel um, and he caused David to turn against the Israelites. He said, go count the people of Israel and Judah. Mm -hmm. So David went and counted and see, they're making sure to show you the, the difference between Israel and Judah. OK, I didn't put that there. That was already there. We just never really noticed it. So watch this. So King David said to Joab, the commander of the army, go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people. Then I will know how many there are. Now, notice he says all the tribes of Israel. 
He doesn't say Israel and Judah. He says, go count Israel. So are you trying to subjugate Israel in front of our faces? Watch this. Um, from Dan to Beersheba. Then I will know how many there are. Why does he need to know how many there are? Because he wants an army too. He wants to feel comforted in military might from a number. Not from our creator. Watch this. But Joab said to the king, we're in verse three, guys. May the Lord your God give you a hundred times more people. And may my master, the king, live to see this happen. Why do you want to do this? But the king commanded Joab and the commanders of the army. So they left the king to count the Israelites. They're counting the Israelites. <laughs> Why are you counting them Israelites, David? Let's keep going. After crossing the Jordan River, they camped near Ararat on the south side of the city in the ravine. Sorry, the ravine. They went through Gad on to Ge Jazer. Then they went to Gilead in the land of Tatim, Hadshi, and to Dan Jan and around to Sidon. They went to the strong walled city of Tyre, to all the cities of the Hittites and the Canaanites. So they're numbering people from other nations. That's right, because David wound up having people. Uh, Bathsheba was married to, what's his name, the Hittite. So, yeah. Finally, they went to southern Judah to Beersheba. Okay, so they did wind up going to Judah. After nine months and 20 days, they had gone through all the land. Then they came back to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say that they was numbering people in Judah, though. You know? I think they just went back home. Like, okay, we got a good counter, everybody. Let's just go on back home. We know who we got. Joab gave the list of the people to the king. There were 800 thousand men in Israel who could use the sword and 500,000 men in Judah. Oh, this probably worried David. <laughs> right, because Israel is outnumbering uh, those that are in uh, Judah. You got 500,000 in Judah, but you got 800,000 swordsmen in Israel. Okay. David felt ashamed after he counted the people. He said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly by what I've done, Lord. I beg you to forgive me, your servant, because I've been very foolish. Now, check this out. When David got up in the morning, the Lord spoke his word to Gad, who was a prophet in David's seer. The Lord told Gad, go and tell David. This is what the Lord says. I offer you three choices. Choose one of them and I will do it to you. So Gad went to David and said to him, should three years of hunger come to you and your land? Or should your enemy chase you for three months? Or should there be three days of disease in your land? Think about it. Then decide which of these things I should tell the Lord who sent me. Okay, guys. So David got a choice to make. All right. He can choose between um, his enemies chasing him for three months Right. He was on the run before, wasn't he? When he was fighting his son, Absalom, he was on the run before, too, when he was fighting Saul. Right. So David's been on the run before. He's he's still with us. He's outlived people. Right. He could have done this one. Or what was the next one? All right. Oh, three years. We're right here in verse 13. Three years of hunger. Right. They could have had three years of a famine for him, himself personally and the land. OK, that was the next one he could have chose. Um, it would have been a little rough, I imagine, you know, uh, famine sweeping through the land. But you learn to get by with less if he had chosen that. But let's go down to the last one. Three days of disease in the land. And the creator tells David, think about it before you decide. All right? He should have thought really long and hard on this one. I'm going to show y'all why. Remember, it's Gad who came to tell him this, right? David said to Gad, we're in 14. I'm in great trouble. Let the Lord punish us because the Lord is very merciful. Don't let my punishment come from human beings. So the Lord sent 
a terrible disease on Israel. Now, remember, who had to choose this? David. Now, did David personally choose to count the people? Or did he hold a town hall meeting and say, hey, everybody in agreement with me, we need to figure out how big our army is. Let's count the men. Everybody in favor, raise your hand. And did the whole village raise their hand? Nah. This was David's personal decision. A good leader would have taken accountability. A good leader would have chosen the first of the three. No, not even the first, I'm sorry, the second of the three, right. I meant the one that he personally has to endure. Because out of the three options, two were gonna be bad for Israel. And they had nothing to do with the decision to count the people. Only this particular leader, David, decided to count the people. So shouldn't David have decided to be on the run and deal with this himself? Check this out. Instead, he says right here, uh, let the Lord punish us, right? But he doesn't choose anything that's punishing just him. No, he said right here, because the, the disease came on Israel, right? Notice that the disease came on Israel. He had to have chosen the last three days of disease. All right. After the creator said, think about it, right? Think about it. What are you going to do as a good leader? Are you going to take accountability? Or are you going to throw it on the people? And what did David do? He gave us disease, guys. Watch this. So the Lord sent a, we're in 15, a terrible disease on Israel. It began in the morning and continued until the to chosen time to stop. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 people died. When the angel raised his arm towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord felt very sorry about the terrible things that had happened. He said to the angel who was destroying the people, that is enough. Put down your arm. The angel of the Lord then was then by the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite. When David saw the angel that killed the people, he said to the Lord, I'm the one who sinned and did the wrong. These people only followed me like sheep. Is he not telling the truth? Is David not telling the truth right here? Did the people not follow David like sheep? They did nothing wrong. Please punish me and my family. Okay. I'm going to end it there. You do yourself a favor and finish reading this. All right. But remember, a terrible disease came on to the Israelites, right? And who bought the news? Gad. Why is that important? Watch this, y'all. I'm going to show y'all where these flies come from. Anybody ever hear of the Gad fly? <laughs> it was in our face, guys. Gad's fly, right? The Gad fly. Any various flies, such as a horse fly, bot fly, or wobble fly that bites or annoys livestock. All right, guys. Now, y'all know what a gad fly is. It bites and annoys livestock, right? It specifically talked about a wobble fly. So let's go to the wobble fly and see what this wobble fly is doing, guys. Let's go. Let's go. I got my coffee. Shout out to my coffee drinkers. We drinking coffee right now. Oh my gosh, this makes me want to puke looking at that though. Uh, warble fly is an insect also known as cattle grub. Right guys? Why did I open with Genesis 3? because this is the cattle grub. More importantly, guys, the heel fly. Ain't that funny, right? Because what, what did Genesis 3 um, 
14 and 15 tell us, right, that uh, the woman's seed would bruise uh, its head, right, but it would bruise her heel, the, her seed's heel, her offspring's heel, right there at the top, guys. You see it? So not only is it called the wobble fly, the cattle grub, associated with they mama, the cattle right here, right guys? Shout out to you, KG, because this is one heck of an episode. It goes back to your question, right guys? It's a cattle grub, all right? And it's bruising the heel. What do you know? So let's talk about it. The wobble fly, any member of a family of insects in the fly order sometimes classified in the family of hypodermatidae. Dermatidae, child, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it go, but y'all see this crazy word right here. The wobble or the bot fly are large, heavy, and bee-like. The females deposit their eggs on the legs of cattle, okay? The larvae penetrate the skin and migrate through the body for several months and produce a characteristic lump or wobble on the animal's back. The wobble contains a hole which is used for breathing. When fully developed, the cattle grub emerges and drops to the ground to pupate and transform into an adult fly. The breathing holes cut by the larvae in the cowhide reduce its commercial value. And another, of course it reduces its commercial value because that cow is sick. Okay, that's not what they're trying to tell you. But clearly, it's a parasite that was inside of it. We know it's associated with disease. Those are sick cows, guys. The wobble contains a hole, which is used for breathing. Oh, we already read that, guys. Down here. Oh, they're going to start off with this crazy word. So this thing here is another, is another wobble fly that causes economic losses of leather, meat, and milk in reindeer herds. The wobble fly is widespread in Europe and North America. We back to the place, guys. They said it's widespread in North America. Control methods in cattle include oral administration of insecticides and manual removal of the larvae from the animal's back. Okay, guys, this thing falls out of its back. This is disgusting. <laughs> oh, man, we're getting on to some crazy stuff. I'm going to leave that with y'all guys. Remember, this thing is called the gadfly. Remember who came to David to give him the choices, right? And what did David do? Threw it back at the people. Gad said, hey, you're going to have to choose one of two things, David. One of two things, right? David chose the fly. He chose the disease, guys. Now watch this, right? I'm just going to leave y'all on this, and I'm going to let your own brains do the thinking on this one. I just want to close with these two things. Remember back in the day, guys, I told you that the name Leah means wild cow, right? What is the meaning of Leah in Hebrew? Leah means where in Hebrew, but it also has other meanings, including cow, lioness, mistress, and ruler. Which is not true because uh, Rachel was leading the flock of her fathers. Not Leah. It was Rachel the shepherdess. The name comes from the Bible. In the Bible, Leah symbolizes honor for God and her faithfulness to Jacob. In addition, the word means woman. All right. But I like this cow reference personally. All right, guys, I feel like that links her back to uh, that serpent seed. And listen, for some reason, these people are honoring heavenly cows, <laughs> okay? The Book of the Heavenly Cow is an ancient Egyptian text dealing with the rebellion of humanity 
against the sun god. His destruction of the rebels through the goddess Hathor. Okay. Interesting. I mean, not to say I believe this stuff, but it's good to get an idea of what they're thinking in it. I think so personally, guys. I really do. But now every time you swatted a fly, you can thank David. Okay. You can thank David. It said it ended the disease, the three days, right? It stopped the infestation, but we still see flies to this day. So we know that it's associated to that scenario right there, guys. You can bet your money on it. Much love from the front, guys, front line, guys. I'll see you guys next week. Shout out to y'all and y'all be safe. Take care, guys.